Good morning. Welcome to Prime Time in BU Library. Prime Time is designed to celebrate the experiences and accomplishments of Bethel faculty, students, and staff. It is a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library, faculty development, and other offices on campus. We record most of our programming. You can find all the recordings in the BU Digital Library. This is our last presentation of the semester. I think we saved the best for last. <laughs> Watch the library website and Bethel calendar for more events as we celebrate Prime Time's 10th anniversary beginning this February. Today I'm delighted to welcome you to an Edgren Scholars presentation. The Edgren Scholars program supports faculty student research teams as they collaborate on a research project. The project must be one that has the potential to make a significant contribution to a given field of study and the project must reflect meaningful collaboration on research between students and faculty. The Edgren Scholars Program is named after John Alexis Edgren, the founder of what is now Bethel University. One of the key educational principles that Edgren articulated in the 19th century was that the relation between teachers and pupils shall not be that of commander and subject but one of true friendship and helpfulness. It is in this spirit that we established the Edmund Scholars Program in order to encourage and facilitate students and faculty working together. Today, Edmund Scholars Ann Holland and Joan Tiffany, professors of nursing, and nursing senior Ashley Coleman describe the results of a pilot study to test the effectiveness of a training intervention among nursing faculty evaluating student performance and simulation. Join me in welcoming them. So as Pamela mentioned, my name is Ashley Coleman. Um, I re received the Edgren Scholarship this summer to collaborate with my professors, um, Ann Holland and Joan Tiffany. Unfortunately, Joan Tiffany couldn't be here today due to an unfortunate um, series of events with her car. She is stranded on the side of her boat right now. Um, <laughs> we'll miss her, but we, will. we got it. <laughs> um, also on our team, we had Drs. Vicki Chug, uh, Dr. Linda Blasevich, um, Dr. Deborah Bambini, and then Dory Fritz. Um, <coughs> um, throughout the summer, we looked at the um, study involving the effective evaluator training on reliability of high stakes assessment and simulation. Um, so some of the objectives throughout this presentation, we are looking to describe the need uh, for evaluator training on high stakes assessment of student performance and simulation, uh, describe the training intervention developed to prepare faculty for performance evaluation, and to discuss the results of the pilot study implications for nursing education programs and future research. So there's really no arguing that simulation is becoming core to um, nursing education. Uh, attention, or um, initially, simulation was used for formative assessment um, in which simulation was used to guide students and faculty through um, education throughout a semester. Attention is now shifting to using simulation for summative purposes in which um, simulation is being used to determine course grades and progression through nursing programs. So if you consider the significant um, impacts of errors for nurses and nursing students, um, errors such as medication issues, uh, failure to rescue and misdiagnosing can have serious consequences for our patients. Um, so the question really is being asked whether or not nursing should join other professions um, that require performance exams for licensure. If we stop and think about it, um, even hairdressers require performance test outs to gain their license. So is the NCLEX RN um, really sufficient for determining whether or not nursing students are ready for practice. The NLN Fair Testing Guidelines um, sets guides for high stakes assessment in determining um, whether or not the testing and evaluation is fair and equitable. So what it says basically is that progression through a program or failure or a licensure should not be based upon a single um, test, but rather a series. So, for example, failure out of a program or not getting your license cannot rely solely on a single video performance. So, 
So before we can really think about moving forward um, towards a more rigorous requirements and simulation, we need to develop reliable tools and methods for evaluating student performance. Um, we do have some tools available right now. OSCEs are being used for medical students. Um, but the problem that we have with those in nursing education is that they, they evaluate a single skill, such as hand washing. Um, so we have developed some nursing instru um, instruments, um, such as the Lancer uh, clinical rubric, judgment rubric, and the Crane Competency Evaluation Instrument. Um, and those two instruments and tools, they look at determining nursing competence as a whole. So we look at the assessment, diagnosis, the planning, implementing, and evaluation, all while performing um, a certain skill and keeping our patients safe. So did, to, um, during our presentation at the NLN Summit Conference, um, the question was asked about how many faculty have passed the student on to the next um, rotation knowing or believing that they were incompetent. Um, and much to my own surprise, there was a lot of faculty in the room who raised their hands. Um, what surprised me even more was that the faculty standing up in front of the room with me were not surprised by that. Um, and the reason for that is that current student evaluation uh, is really very subjective. So it's very difficult for faculty to fail a student without um, with having and have that decision upheld against any protest from the department or the students. So we really have to figure out a way to make performance evaluations defensible. So our pilot study was an extension of the NLN High Stakes Study. Um, and we aim to refine the evaluation process by asking what is the effect of a training intervention and what is the effect of personality characteristics on faculty's ability to achieve intra and inter grade reliability. Uh, we conducted the pilot study to test out the training intervention and study procedures before we began the full study because it's much easier to make adjustments with a smaller amount of participants. And it gave us the information that we needed to move confidently into the full study um, and improve inter and inter reliability. reliability. For our study, we use the same definitions of simulation and high stakes assessment as were used in the NLN um, high stakes study. Simulation is said to be an activity of having students perform patient care situation using clinical judgment in high fidelity environment. And by high fidelity, we mean high realism, not necessarily highly advanced or sophisticated mannequin use. Um, high stakes assessment is defined as an evaluator process associated with yeah. a simulation activity yeah. that has major academic, educational, or employment consequences. Um, and that definition is the one in which is currently outlined in the INACSL simulation standards. Participants in this study evaluated student performances that demonstrated their end of program level of competence. So evaluators don't always agree on A, what are expected patterns of nursing behaviors, uh, B, how to prioritize data, and C, what is essential when performing nursing skills. Um, in other words, evaluators don't always agree on what clinical competence looks like. So the evaluators decided whether or not students had reached competency using the definition that you see up here on the screen. And the definition is the ability to observe and gather information, recognize deviations from expected patterns, prioritize data, make sense of data, maintain a professional response demeanor, provide clear communication, execute effective interventions, perform nursing skills correctly, evaluate nursing interventions, and self-reflect for performance improvement within a culture of safety. So you can see why defining clinical competence is so complicated with a definition like that. What we really need is to develop a shared mental model of competence. So an individual evaluator uses his knowledge and skills, um, clinical reasoning and judgment to determine whether or not the student has reached competence to proceed throughout the program. But it's unreasonable to expect that a single evaluator can evaluate all, all student performances all the time. So instead, nursing programs take on a team approach. Um, but one of the problems to doing that is that we have to develop a collaborative and similar conceptualization. Um, of what that competence looks like, and basically that's what we refer to as a shared mental model. So McComb and Simpson define mental models as frameworks or knowledge structures um, that help individuals perceive, predict, judge, and explain the world around them, and to recognize and remember relationships within the environment. 
when we share a mental model, all the evaluators are on the same page. Um, and that shared mental model is really essential to performing um, evaluation assessment that is fair, equitable, and defensible. So this study is seeking to build through a training intervention a shared mental model for end of the program competence. Um, our participants have no prior relationship or shared curriculum, but we're hoping that they have a shared perspective, um, perspective on what clinical knowledge, skills, and abilities are needed by end of the program students um, to progress into the field. So the work of our intervention is to facilitate the development of the shared mental model, um, but we have to ask the question, how, how did we do this? McComb and since then have also suggested that the process of developing a shared mental model can be enhanced by helping team members understand um, the components of a shared mental model. And we did that through a training, web training webinars um, in which our researchers met with our participants. And um, researcher Yonker also adds that expert accuracy is a necessary element to developing um, a shared mental model. And mental models can be um, enhanced by comparing the model to an expert model. So in the context of the study, um, participants viewed and discussed student performances for which the expert evaluation had been set by um, the researchers, and that was accomplished again through webinar meetings between researchers and participants. Um, our study began by recruiting five participants who were considered to have um, expertise in simulation, and we did that through personal networking. Um, and we set up a Blackboard learning management system from which all the study materials were sent and received. Um, and that Blackboard learning management system was set up a lot like a virtual classroom. Um, so participants could interact with one another as well as with the researchers. Um, a basic orientation and advanced evaluator training components were completed over two months. And then finally, um, the pilot study was um, concluded with an experimental portion of the study over a one month period. We used a number of tools to collect our data. The first was a demographic survey, and that looked at the, the gender, the age, state, academic level, um, type of program, and previous experience and simulation of each of the participants. And then after extensive um, literature um, search and reviewing, we determined that the Creighton Competency Evaluation instrument was going to be the most valid and reliable tool to use in our study. Um, and we actually used the same video performances um, that were used in the previous NLN um, high stakes study with their permission. Uh, Clifton StrengthsFinder inventory was used to collect qualitative data, um, and we'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, and then finally, we had a, a pilot study feedback survey to collect participants' thoughts on how to refine the post study. Is that the yours too? No, this one's you. This, this, this one was Jones, but again, she's okay on with us, so I'm I'm filling in for Joan. <laughs> the Strengths Finder assessment, actually, many of you might be familiar with this and may have taken the Strengths Finder inventory. Um, it is a web-based assessment of personality with 177 items, and. Um, you are given 20 seconds to make a judgment between two items about which one best describes you. And then the results are compiled and um, there are actually, I think, 34, is it 34 strengths that um, can, you know, that arise from this assessment. And um, our participants um, learned their top five strengths. And so the assessment helps to identify um, areas where we have the greatest potential for building on our strengths. So as Ashley mentioned, we developed a training intervention. We wanted to answer the question, could we train faculty to be consistent in their evaluation of student clinical performance? And so we researched the literature and drawing from previous studies, we developed a basic orientation and we developed the advanced evaluator training. And so the basic orientation had some documents um, for the participants to read, to introduce them to the study. They completed the StrengthsFinder inventory. 
um, they, we provided them an article um, from the literature about the CCEI tool. And then they viewed a video of a student performance and rated it using the CCEI tool. Then our participants um, in the pilot study proceeded to the advanced evaluator training. And we designed two webinars for that. We, um, first they participated in a training, in an advanced evaluator training webinar where we had, we, um, what we did is we played segments of the orientation video that they rated and we dubbed over, we did a voice dub over of our expert evaluation, how we were interpreting that performance and applying the, um, the criteria from the tool. And then we discussed that, and we discussed the, the, the definition of clinical competence. Um, the participants had to score the tool, which had 16 competency items on it, and then they had to make a decision. Is the student competent? Yes or no? and give two reasons, there are two primary reasons for that decision, that competency decision of yes or no. So in this first two hour webinar, we reviewed that practice video, we discussed, and what we attempted to do was to help them come to agreement with each other about um, applying the tool, the criteria, and determining competence. Then we had them score three more videos. So we had three additional, three different student performance videos and they scored those. We did some analysis on their scoring and then we um, convened again in a coaching webinar and so you know we shared with them kind of what their statistics were and we talked more, more about okay now three different situations how do we apply these criteria? And so our goal by the end of the coaching webinar was to you know, really try to refine that shared mental model. Then they repeated their evaluation of the training evalu of the training videos because we wanted to look not only at inter-rater reliability, but intra-rater reliability. So if I view a performance now, and I view it a month from now, am I going to score it the same? Because that's part of fair evaluation as well. Then once they completed that, then they proceeded to the experimental phase of the study, which was they got three new videos, and they had to apply that um, shared mental model to those three videos, and then they rated them a second time. So we designed this, this training intervention for the study. So, um, we wanted to present the results of this pilot study. Um, for the demographic data, again, we only had five participants, and all the participants were female. Three of the participants were ages 51 to 60. One was 30 between the ages of 31 to 40, and one was um, between the ages of 61 to 70. All of the participants taught in one of three Midwestern states. Four of the participants held a master's degree, one held a doctoral degree. Uh, two of the participants taught in an associate degree RN program. Four taught in baccalaureate programs. So if you do your math, what you figure is one of those participants worked at a school where they had both associate degree and baccalaureate students and she taught in both of those programs. And then one participant also taught in an entry level master's program. And only one participant taught in a program that was currently conducting high stakes assessment and simulation. The other four, were, their programs were not currently doing high stakes assessment and simulation. So we um, conducted quantitative data on the scoring of these, um, of the CCEI. And so over the whole study, there were seven video performances that were evaluated. They evaluated the training video, the orientation video, they evaluated three training videos and three experimental videos. And so um, we conducted um, quantitative um, measurement for that and I'll just tell you, we really struggled with how we were gonna analyze the data. I'll talk more about lessons learned at the end. Um, but what we did see, we saw evidence, even though our procedures were not great, 
and we were kind of switching our analytic procedures as we went, but we did see evidence that as a result of the training, the inter-rater inter reliability increased. In fact, for the total score that was awarded to the videos, the um, inter-rater reliability was 0 0.70, which is considered strong. Um, the Yes, no competency decision, that was low, that was 0 0.40. So that was one where participants, even with the shared Venom model, still struggled to uh, agree with each other. Um, so as a result of a lot of discussion and trialing different analytic procedures, we identified you know, the um, analytic procedures we were going to perform at the group level and at the individual level um, for, the, for the full study. One um, interesting uh, learning from this, from the data analysis, was that um, participants had a more difficult time being consistent in their, with each other, in agreeing with each other about their evaluations if the quality of the performance was medium, like if it was kind of a mid-level, okay? If the performance was a really good performance, they were more consistent in evaluating that. If it was kind of an in-between level performance, they had a harder time being consistent, more variability in how they were applying those criteria. So just, you know, even the student performance <coughs> part of it can really affect it. So for the strengths finder results, um, we initially had thought we could do quantitative analysis with the strengths finder results. And our statistician said, no, they're, they really aren't provided in a way that allows us to do any kind of quantitative correlational analysis. Um, and, but this is the breakdown of the five participants and their strengths. You can see what the top strengths were, um, and then the number of strengths that fell into the four domains of the strengths finder. So high on strategic thinking, relationship building, executing. Not really surprising that they're educators and they're high in learner. <laughs> And then the pilot study feedback survey data. Um, so we put together this survey that the participants completed at the very end, and we wanted feedback from them about how did the study procedures go, you know, what was this experience like participating in these webinars, and, and you know, how valuable that was. And so we, in, on the, the, the participants evaluated these questions on a five-point Likert scale. Five of the items evaluated the advanced evaluator training module, and those items received a mean score of 4.6. Five, or ten items, um, oh wait, did I miss one? Five of them um, evaluated the basic orientation, and those got a 4.6. Ten of the items measured the, um, study procedures and technology, and the, those items received a mean of 4.88. Two of the items evaluated the study outcomes, and um, participants um, awarded that a four, mean of 4.6. Um, the lowest rating of any survey item was um, Clifton Strengths Finder Assessment. They found that it was not easily accessible, so we had to do some adjustment of how we made that available to students. Um, in the full, or to participants in the full study. We asked the participants to tell us, uh, estimate the number of hours they spent on the study. We had predicted to them that it was going to take them up to 19 hours um, to do the study. And you could imagine um, that's a big investment of time for someone to volunteer to participate in a study. And the um, number of hours that they said they spent on study activities ranged from 10 to 40. Really, a lot of variability, but the mean was 21.1. So that wasn't real far from what we projected. I don't know how 
someone got it done in 10 hours. I don't even, can't even imagine that. Um, and I think for the peer person that took 40, they probably, I would imagine they watched those videos over and over again, you know, because they were uncertain about how to score it and they wanted to view it again. That's probably why they had so many hours. All the participants stated that the webinar discussions of the scoring criteria were most helpful in preparing them to evaluate the videos. And several participants gave some recommendations that were really worthy and we realized they were necessary improvements for the full study. So we learned a lot of lessons in this study and that's what you do. You, in pilot studies, you learn a lot of lessons um, about what to do and what not to do. And so there's a few categories of lessons we had some problems with technology. We initially used an online conferencing software called GoToMeeting to conduct the webinars. And we had all kinds of audio feedback problems with it, such that one of the webinars, we just had to quit because we couldn't understand each other. We'd get all this echo. And um, our participants were very patient with us. We switched then. Um, Midway, before we did the coaching webinars, we purchased a membership to Zoom, which is another um, conferencing platform, and that turned out to be very stable, and we didn't have any other problems with that, and we used that in the full study. Um, prior to beginning the pilot, four of our five faculty team members had evaluated all of these videos and come up what, with what we thought was an expert evaluation. And as we started having conversations with our participants in these webinars, you know, they were bringing up things that we hadn't considered. And we realized, oh, we're not done with creating this expert model. And so we realized that our goal really changed to what we wanted to do was, over the course of the pilot, come up with that expert model um, that represented their, their shared agreement. And so the process, for us was really eye-opening and it was really humbling. Our study timeline was delayed for a variety of reasons. The development of the intervention took longer than we expected. Um, we originally were going to start in March, then we postponed it to April, and in the end it started the first week of June, which was perfect. I think God meant it to be because, you know, that was, we, we had invited Ashley to participate with us and we got the funding, so it, 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 was, it was what needed to happen. But then we ran into summer vacations. <laughs> and um, so that was a challenge. Another issue with the timeline was that um, we had built into this intervention that at certain periods after they rated a video, we were going to do some data analysis and then share the results of that data analysis with them. Well, we didn't build any time into our timeline for getting the data to the statistician and given him enough time to run it and you know so then we had to keep kind of bumping things back and so we were able to um, change you know create a timeline for the full study that built those data analysis periods in and the pilot study taught us a lot about data analysis um, we we like I mentioned, spent that entire pilot study trialing different statistical analysis methods and refining them through many meetings with our statistician. We had predicted that our analysis was going to replicate the NLN high stake study, which we were extending, but our statistician really helped us understand that we were asking a different question than they did, and so it required different statistical um, analysis methods. We also learned a really difficult lesson about the importance of finding the right statistician. When we started the project, um, one of our team members at a different university had said, oh, well, we have a statistician that is, provides free statistical analysis for faculty projects. We're like, yay, we can get free um, statistical support. And we learned you get what you pay for. <laughs> And what we learned is that statistician was really an output number cruncher and that we weren't getting the decision support and the interpretive advisement that we really needed. And so we had to switch statisticians midway and pay for it, but um, it, you know, it proceeded, um, it, we got what we needed from that. So can't, can't tell you that you know how many times Joan and I said to each other, well, that's why we're doing a pilot study, because we just kept encountering all of these issues. 
So our next steps with the, you know, we concluded the pilot study at the end of August, okay? And um, we, even during the summer months, began preparing a manuscript, and so Ashley was very involved with that. Um, Ashley, Joan, and I, and one other of our team members um, really, um, you know, did a lot of work on that pilot, on that pilot study manuscript. And Joan um, was going to tell you today that she's going to submit it for publication tomorrow. <laughs> so we're um, submitting it to publication in um, Nursing Education Perspectives, which is the official journal of the National League for Nursing. And they funded our study, so it's very appropriate that we are um, submitting it there. We launched the full study on Monday, September 26th, and we met our deadline. That was the day we were going to launch it, and we were ready. Um, and so um, it's a nationwide experimental study with a control group and intervention group. We started with 102 participants, and we have lost a number of them because of the rigor and the demands of the study. And um, so we, we don't have that many participants currently. We um, expect to conclude data collection um, this month, um, and we'll be doing analysis in January and February. And then we had the privilege to present at the 2016 NLN Education Summit um, in September. That was in Orlando. Ashley accompanied us there, and our whole team was there, except for our research assistant, Dory Fritz. And um, that was a, a great experience. Ashley's going to comment a little bit about it, I think. So implications for nursing education, there are a number of them. Um, Ashley commented about that definition of clinical competence, how complex it is, and you know, our study experience sure showed us that evaluating clinical performance is very complex and it's very nuanced, and our participants had varying perspectives about what was really important, you know, even using this tool that you know, had described um, criteria. And so we, we really, believe that developing a shared mental model is essential, but that that shared mental model needs to be revisited and revisited, it needs to be refined, it needs to be reinforced, and as team members come on, you know, they have to agree to that as well. Our participants found rating the patient safety criteria to be the most difficult, and the Patient safety criteria are ones that we emphasize from the beginning of the program, like hand washing and patient identification. But what we learned when we are evaluating video performances in simulation labs, that you know we can't always see everything. Depending on how they have the video set and how their room is set up, and we struggled with, okay, are we just going to be really firm about this and say, we didn't see them do it, so they obviously didn't do it, or, or you know, we weren't sure about what those students were taught about how to perform in their simulation lab. So what it really said to us is that if we proceed with using video recorded simulations for evaluation, the evaluators have to know if there are some shortcuts that the students are instructed to take what the limitations of that environment are, or otherwise it won't be fair. Um, that deciding about the definition of clinical conference co um, competence is really challenging. Um, we used a tool that had 16 points, okay? So is 13 out of 16 competent? Does it base, is it based on a number? Or are there certain items that are more important than others? You know, if a patient, if a student doesn't ID, ID the patient, it's an automatic fail. You know, deciding, is it about the points? It is it about, you know, essential critical behaviors? Those are questions that really need to be answered. So implications for research, um, we can't emphasize enough the importance of conducting a pilot study. Um, our full study would have failed miserably if we hadn't done a pilot study. And, um, you know, so when studies, procedures, and activities are complex, um, we have to try them out. And we really think that this study is the tip of the iceberg for what needs to be researched about high stakes assessment. We need to ask questions what's the right amount and format for faculty training? 
How do you help teams of faculty develop a shared mental model? What evaluation tools are the most effective? Summer taught me a lot about um, nursing research as a whole. First of all, how extensive the recruiting process is, um, especially, I think Ian mentioned, we had originally had a regional study and then we had to move it to national study to um, recruit more participants. Um, and the, the recruitment process was extensive and long, but it was really essential to um, the study because without participants, we have no study. Um, second was the importance of the pilot study and just mentioned all of the learning um, that took place throughout the pilot and without that, you know, all those issues would have occurred during our full study with 102 participants versus five. Um, another learning point was um, how to seek answers to your questions. I think it's easy for us right now to Google everything. Um, but sometimes we ask questions that there's not reliable answers to out there, um, or even original questions that haven't even been asked yet. So how do you go about seeking those answers when they're not online um, or in, you know, in, in literature yet? Um, so that process, just seeing how that unfolds, was really valuable for me over the summer. Uh, and Anne kind of was laughing at me. I saw just as much value in being proven wrong as I saw in being proven right um, through the, the software that didn't work, you know, all that stuff. Um, we can take steps closer to being right, so we can prove ourselves right and proving ourselves wrong. Um, and finally, the summit conference was an amazing experience um, presenting at the educational summit for that on, um, you know, standing up in front of faculty. I've said this right before. Um, if you can say it in front of your faculty, I think you can say it in front of everyone. Anyway. Um, so just the, the experience of that um, and gaining confidence and presenting what you know, um, as well as the networking that took place at the summit was incredible. She got recruited to graduate <laughs> programs, so mm -hmm. they want her. Yes, yes, so that was, it was a very valuable experience. Um, I think Ashley was the only baccalaureate student that presented. And I don't even know if there were others attending, but I think right. you were the only baccalaureate student presented at this national conference. So the people were impressed. A lot of jokes about um, them talking about, you know, their, their master's degrees and everything. I'm like, I gotta pass that Clex. <laughs> <laughs> Right, um, and finally the final takeaway I've been hearing for I think the last four years, um, all of us have their own nursing uh, program, is that we have to learn to think like a nurse. You can teach really the nursing skills to anyone, but learning to think like a nurse is the most valuable thing that you can take away from the program. So, thank you all for coming. And those are our resources. Any questions? Oh, yes, Darlene. Are you planning to, um, to write up the Yes, uh, I think we probably have ideas of uh, writing several articles from the full study, one that would certainly present the results, you know, the findings and the results, but I, I think we've talked about, we really need to write an article about this shared mental model idea and, you know, kind of what we've learned about it. I think that is a big contribution in the literature. There hasn't been a lot written in the nursing literature about the shared mental model. These sources that we drew are you know, a lot from a lot of other um, disciplines as well. So I, I would say at least two articles. So that'll be a goal. And then we, are, we've, we have submitted abstracts to present. Well, actually, we've, we've submitted an abstract to present the pilot study in Ireland this summer at the Sigma Theta Tau International International Research Congress. So some of our, if we get accepted for that, some of our members will be attending, and I'm not sure I'm going. So I'd love to go, but I don't know if I'm going to go. And I don't know if Ashley's going or not. So. And then um, we, so we uh, have already applied to present the full study at the 2017 NLN Education Summit. And we will apply to present at the Anaxal Summit the following January, or the Anaxal Conference the following January. We'll probably shop this thing around, I guess, in three, four, five times. Other questions? Um, the question that I had actually has to do with your, one of your first statements, and that is the numbers. And I understand why clinical faculty 
would probably admit the fact that they, I don't yeah, yes. like the word competent. I think that's because students are in the progress on a journey. So um, teaching first year juniors, it's very difficult to say they're competent. We're just trying to get the keyboard. Seniors, that's a whole different story. But still, the difficulty of understanding um, whether someone is competent or not, even in a video, you can see how difficult when you're dealing with a dynamic clinical. But the idea of a shared model, particularly as we use more adjuncts, and even um, a clinical assessment for instructors who are basically doing clinical, I find it very difficult <clears throat> in terms of evaluation, because there really isn't much to go up against except for your own idea of what is competent. So it struck me just as an I struck me as an idea. Is this also a way in which we can do better education and training for clinical instructors and for adjuncts within clinical? I that I think that's a really good point. We recognize on our team that we were specifically focusing on high stakes assessment in clinical simulation, but the implications for what we learn in this study are huge just for clinical evaluation. You know, when an instructor is out with a student at a clinical site and we are needing to decide, okay, have they met the objectives, the learning objectives, it's, it's you know, that's an even more dynamic experience than watching a video performance and it's very related. And so, Hopefully what we could learn about developing a shared mental model in this very limited situation, we could um, help to improve clinical evaluation. I agree. Well, it's after 11 o'clock, so um, thank you so much for coming.